Thank you. Um, I'm Leslie, and this is Jen. I'm Jen. And thank you very much for joining us here this evening. We're thrilled to have been invited. And I'd like to repeat what Max said. We, uh, when Max invited us to speak, one of the original ideas we had was specifically to engage in dialogue with each other because of an idea that collaboration is such a critical part of our practices and then what we think would be of interest to you. So I really do hope that you'll take to heart the idea that we are interested in talking with you, not necessarily at you. So if there's anything at any point that you wanna raise your hand or just throw a question out, please do so. Um, so I have a marketing studio and just really briefly, I'm gonna introduce myself, then let Jen introduce herself and then we're gonna show a few slides and, and get into some show and tell. Uh, so I have an art history degree from UCLA and then I went back and have an executive ed certificate from their business school. I've had my own marketing studio for 15 years. Prior to that, I worked in-house at predominantly product development, um, product marketing firms. And um, I also have a professional membership organization and an online shop, just because we all need to have our fingers in a bunch of different pies. We're always happier when we have many projects going. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Jen Dallas. I'm a textile designer and an interior designer. I have my own uh, namesake interior design firm in Santa Monica, as well as a home goods accessories um, shop online called Maple Jude & Co. We uh, have our own line of textiles and ceramic tiles and a whole bunch of home accessories like tablecloths, napkins. And um, I have a bachelor's degree in, in interior design and a bachelor's degree in graphics. And I've owned my firm, my interior design firm, for about 10 years. And Maple Jude, I just started this year. We launched at the West Edge Design Show, if any of you guys went, um, where we launched our first collection of textiles and tiles. Fantastic. OK, so um, I want to get into, so I mentioned that these are the three brands that I, um, that I own. And Ocean Park Studio is the one that actually pays the rent. Um, and <laughs> Textile Art LA is a passion project, and then Akagari Trading Company is an artisan online shop. And um, this is some of the work that I've done as part of Ocean Park Studio and part of my professional background. And it's um, working for Brown Jordan, which is a chair design company. And one of the things that really grabs me about this, number one, is that I worked for a, um, our chief design officer, who's actually a graduate of your program. So he studied industrial design here um, in your department. And working for him was an absolute mind-blowing experience, because this was really both about understanding excellence in product design and also understanding excellence in presentation how you make something look desirable. I mean, these are chair ads, and frankly, they look like, you know, it looks like fashion photography, it looks like, you know, high-end car advertising, et cetera. Um, and for me, what really grabs me also, and then this is another one of my brands, Walker Zanger. Um, I work with a lot of their marketing and do some of their language so what will you create and how will you be inspired are the sort of dynamic ideas behind these ad concepts. Um, and then I also work on PR, which is on the left, getting this classic 1950s brand some brand new attention. And then even something radically different here on the right with um, a cattle rancher up in the Central Valley who wanted to um, brand his beef and we had to come up with which of course is a literal and a metaphorical thing right so <laughs> sorry I'm using myself um, but doing the packaging and and figuring out how to present his brand in the marketplace I liked that work because it was so different from the other kinds of, of projects that I worked on um, and 
for me, a lot of this has to do with the idea that I knew I wanted to study art history because I was the kid who, if you took me to a museum, you couldn't get me out, which is not an experience that um, everyone has, apparently. Um, and, but I was also raised by someone who thought that I would never get a job. And what became interesting to me is that what marketing allows you to do is understand that we all have to process the world in a visual way. And I think that you're all growing up in a time where that's even more obvious to you. Um, the rise of Instagram and social media makes it so that you know, that's the predominant social currency, right? You have, to, you have to look at images, you have to understand images, and you have to know what they're trying to tell you. Um, and what was fun for me was being able to work with people like you who can develop product and then help you figure out how do you tell that story and how do you tell it in a way that's going to get somebody to want to engage with it and buy it. Um, and if I can jump back here, one of the things is it's not just that I want you to buy these chairs, but these chairs cost $1,500 and more which is part of why they look like this, because I need you to believe that they're worth that kind of money. Um, and then what else do I do? And then this is just an idea of um, my online shop, which again, a lot of it has to do with brand creation. So we import tea, but we did the packaging and the labeling and all that ourselves. And again, because it's $30 for essentially six servings of tea. So if it doesn't look like it's worth money, a lot of money, you might, well, you still might not buy it, but we're hoping you will. Um, <laughs> oh, and I still don't remember which direction this works in. And then this is the, um, the branding for the, the textile um, project. And I think that might be the last of my intro slides. So I'm gonna um, let Jen sort of give you some show and tell on what she works on. This one goes for it. That one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, this is me. Um, you know, I consider myself one of the lucky ones because when I was young, at a very young age, I knew what I wanted to do. And my mom loves to tell this story of um, hearing me in the middle of the night moving furniture around in my room because I couldn't take it. I needed to move a dresser from one side to the other. And she'd be like, Jennifer, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I just don't want it there. <laughs> I just couldn't wait till morning. So, um, when I found out about interior design, I was obsessed. It was it for me. It's interesting though, from going from school, what I really wanted to do outside of school was be a commercial designer. I wanted to be doing restaurants and spas and hotels and that's what I did. I did that for like 20 years. And then when I moved out here to California, I fell in love with residential. And, um, and I worked for a designer in Santa Monica for about uh, six years before I went on my own and I've been on my own for about 10. And uh, so here's some slides, because I want to show you, you know, how to do it. <laughs> Kitchen. Just a project board. I like to keep my boards really fluid, just like even have stacking. So they're three-dimensional, so people touch and feel them. I find that clients really love that. Because for one, if you give them a presentation board that's just kind of picture, 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 it feels already done and they're not involved in their process and they love to be involved with process. So like on this situation, like if I, you know, I have the mirror or the lamp, like if they don't like the lamp, I just take it out. Not, it's not all pinned up. So I work very much like that. This is a canning kitchen I did, which I think is interesting. The, the couple was obsessed with canning vegetables. They actually have a kitchen in their house dedicated to canning vegetables. <laughs> not kidding. I love that though. I love it when people get so specific about what they want and how they live. It makes my job fun. Um, here's some of my textiles. And this is like a box of samples that I'm sending to a showroom. And my first layout of the tiles. More pictures. We have our own line of pillows and tablecloths. And these are tea towels and tablecloths. So would you mind backing up for a minute? So one of the, 
I find this sort of fascinating is that, so one of the origin stories I tell of myself is I'm an introvert and really I would much rather be alone at home in my jammies. <laughs> but I try to force myself to get up every once in a while and for instance I go to West Edge and so that's the trade show up in Santa Monica every year, you, you might be familiar with it. and. West Edge really tries to pull in the best of local um, artisanal brands. And I play a little exercise with myself because I like to see what's, what's new and what's happening. And I walk around and I look and when something grabs my attention, I'm going to stop and chat. And in September, in October, October of this like year, so five weeks ago, I'm, I'm walking and all of a sudden I, I see essentially what you're looking at right here. And I think, wow, I mean, it's, it's graphically powerful, it's intelligently presented, there's clearly like a logic to this product line. And so I stopped and chatted um, with the woman in the booth and it turns out to be Jen here. And so, you know, I played my other like favorite game, which is that when I, when I'm around energy that feels right, and I'm, you know, with a creative mind that I like, it's like, oh hi, can I give you my card? Can we go to lunch? Can we talk about what you're working on? Because one of the things that I find fascinating is that it's astonishing actually how many of us want to connect. And I, it seems so obvious, but we're so stuck on our phones or maybe so stuck on our projects that we forget that behind all that, there's just another human being who wants to say, hey, I'm playing with some really fun stuff too. I'll show you what my toys are. You know, like, what, <laughs> what are your toys? And so um, we just met. And, and then the next thing I know, I said, hi, like, come to Long Beach with me and have this conversation because <laughs> Because we can explore, like I would love to know, frankly, how did you decide to go from, okay, you're doing interior design with your client base, you know, what was the inspiration, what was the hunger that said, okay, I'd like to go out and, and launch my own, my own brand, and how did you? I've always wanted to have my own brand or my own products, and I have sketchbooks after sketchbooks of things I've drawn, a lot of stationery, cards and things. That's how I started when I was like 16, 17 years old. And then um, I, oh, I'm just obsessed with patterns, always been obsessed with patterns. I should tell you too, my father was an art history professor and so and he taught uh, studio drawing and everything. So when I was a young kid, I would be in the back of his studio class of throwing pots or drawing or it was really awesome. Um, but so it kind of just was an extension of me you know, just a natural extension of me. And I also, just seeing the clients that I see, seeing what I, what's out there, I knew I could add something to the marketplace that was a little different, that was of me. So, felt awesome to do it. Okay. Um, well, so, and then related to that, I would say that that's, um, that might, you know, it's similar to how I got into, did I go in the right direction? Oh yeah, so how I got into, um, art history. Well, I was actually raised by a single mom who um, sometimes in the summer would take me to, we lived in Northern Virginia, so she'd take me to the Smithsonian and leave me there with 20 bucks when she went off to work and then she'd come back no and pick way. me up in the evening. And this was, by the way, I'm so old that this was in the 70s and that was still legal. So, um, <laughs> You but wouldn't do that now. No, you, you'd be arrested now. But on the other hand, she made my whole career. So <laughs> She um, didn't know what she was doing. Yeah. Um, but I was fascinated by Robert Rauschenberg. And he, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he does these like a phenomenal collages that it's paint, it's wood, it's dimensional, it's got dead ravens on it. I mean, they're <laughs> like, they're, it's printmaking. But it was sort of the first time that I had been exposed to somebody who had this creative mind that was just pulling from so many different um, like genres and colorways and materials and all of this stuff. And I was 10. And I'm like, what am I looking at? So I decide I need to be an art history major. And, you know, and as I mentioned before, pretty much everyone had decided that I was never going to get a job and, you know, that I was going to be living on mom's sofa. 
So I was really excited, actually, as I got older and Instagram came up and, you know, Facebook and, and et cetera, and essentially discovered that I was just phenomenally prescient and that now the entire world is about um, being able to look at an image and understand what's being coded for you. And so on the left here is this portrait of Cosimo de' Medici. And you may be familiar with him, but he's one of the um, like big merchant princes from 17th century um, Italian history. And my details might be a little fuzzy, but I'm going for concept rather than specificity here. So don't repeat me on an exam. But the key thing is, is that he's, this is like the original selfie. And, and what he's coding for us is he has the time to sit and have someone paint him, paint a portrait of him. He has the money to pay somebody to paint a portrait. Um, he has the privilege of having a portrait painted. He has access to red, which meant cochineal, which meant that one of his merchant ships was you know, coming back and delivering this um, luxury item. And so, and everyone who saw this image understood what they were looking at. They were looking at power, they were looking at money, they were looking at privilege. And everything that we're doing on social media right now is the same thing, right? We're coding information for people. Look at me, I'm happy. You know, look at me, I'm well fed. Look at me, I'm traveled. Um, and, and your design degrees are essentially um, teaching you to be visual in the sense of understanding the power that you have to convey you know, an emotion to somebody, information to somebody. Um, I don't know if that sparks you know, anything specific to a... I have mixed feelings about the whole technology thing in my <laughs> profession. <laughs> Because to me, a lot of the whole Instagram and all that makes it all seem like everybody's a professional. Uh, am I right? Like there seems to be a little bit of that. So, uh, it, you know, it's kind of, I don't know if I'm the right person to. <laughs> well, but I actually, I love that, I, that concern because I think it also, for instance, the death of magazines is also playing oh, don't into say that. The death of magazines. You're talking to a girl who I get 19 subscriptions a month, okay? I'm obsessed <laughs> with my magazines. I'll never give them up. Okay, well, when I was 13 and I babysat and I don't have children, I don't like children, but I <laughs> babysat because I wanted the money and I bought a subscription to Architectural Digest with my money. They give those okay. away now, though. Okay, at the time, don't tell me that. But they do. But what was, but what's amazing to play on what you said is that what was happening is that you essentially had these like goddesses, like Paige Rents was the goddess of Architectural Digest, yeah. and she was curating what you saw in there, and and yes, there's an egalitarianism in social media, and there's a um, an everybody's an expert. But there's also the sense of, you know, and again, I'm, th I'm thinking about you and your development of a professional self, is that you have a voice. And your, you know, your voice is what do you see and what do you care to repeat? Like, what do you want to share? And of your own design, you know, how do you want that to be seen? And those choices that you make are a critical part of establishing not just your um, like your professional chops, but like in my case, for instance, I have an entire blog where all I'm doing is curating like other people's mm. work that I want people to be aware of or other people's research. Because again, I'm not a designer, but I have I'm educated in design enough that people want to know what what am I finding interesting, and I I think that that's a part of um, you know, part of a part of an education, and then part of what your young career would be. What are you looking at? What are you paying attention to? You? And and are you questioning what other people are looking at, and what are they choosing? Well, and that adds to being uniquely you, because, you know, like I said before, with my designs, putting it out there, I feel like I could feel add something to the marketplace because it's uniquely me. Just like each one of you have something unique that you're going to add to the world. Your design is going to be completely different than your design. That's awesome. 
you know, there's reasons why you're you and you're you. And I think the more we're in touch with like who we are, why we like what we like, why we hate what we hate, that's so important as, as you're saying, growing up into your professional self. I mean, it's ongoing, I'm still doing it. Um, yeah, <laughs> we were just talking yeah. about that on the way here. <laughs> right, like at some point in your life you realize, oh, other people are looking at me like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm still thinking. I'm still growing. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't stop right um oh so what's that i know i know you're like what's that i've never heard of a taxi um okay. <laughs> sorry okay for me as a marketing person and as a storyteller this is one of my all-time favorite examples so i grew up where if you were stupid drunk at a bar <laughs> you had to call a cab, okay, which signaled that you were a sloppy drunk and that you were irresponsible, okay? That, and if you got into a cab, invariably it didn't smell quite right or there was a hole in the floorboards or et cetera, okay? And the only people who rode in cabs were either um, you were too broke to own a car, and, it, and I'm deliberately saying you're, you know, you're broke, or you were in New York. Okay, I mean, those were the only reasons, right? So, what absolutely stinking blew my mind was like, I don't know, five years ago or whatever, this thing comes around called Uber. You know, and again, like, I just turned 50, okay? Like, I don't need somebody to take me somewhere. Oh, I love it, and, though. And I'm <laughs> staring at this, and I'm thinking to myself, I mean, let's get real people. It's the same damn thing. Yeah. Okay? But this make is irresponsible and it doesn't smell good. And look <laughs> at how sexy this is, right? I mean, this is okay. And and look at how it's sorry. But I mean, treating yourself, step it up when you step out for a night. And then this kills me. Creating escapes, your shortcut to everywhere. But look at what this is. I swear to you, when I grew up, we'd all be calling that guy a scrub. Like, dude, you're a loser and you can't afford to show up to your pickup basketball game in your own car. I mean, that would be the story that we would be telling. Now, he's totally hip and he's like getting a ride and someone else has to deal with the insurance and the parking and the gas and all the rest of it. And he doesn't even need to have cash. It's just like, oh yeah, it's just like floating out in the evening. Like I'm telling you, Uber is the most freaking genius thing. But what I'm actually trying to get to is this is marketing. This is storytelling, okay? And then look at the rest of the campaign. Moving people, be the boss, and sharing experiences. I'm like, sign me up. I want a part of that. And, and it is all fundamentally the same thing. They're selling getting you from point A to point B. So do you want to call United Taxi or do you want to call an Uber? Okay. I love the story. And then here's what I love even more is this was so wildly successful for them, which this is clearly about converting all of you into Uber users that they had to drop this campaign. Sorry, I went the wrong way because this thing is backwards, by the way. And now they don't even run that other campaign because now they don't need you. They have too many of you. Now they need you to drive. This is their new campaign. Because they don't need customers anymore. They need drivers <coughs> now. And so again, as a marketing person, I look at that and I think, again, this is about messaging. It's about knowing who your audience is. And it's about staying nimble, right? So I don't need my customer anymore. Now I need my driver. And by the way, look at how totally cool a, you know, he's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. He's got a freshly waxed car, and uh, you know, sparkle. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome. He's not a he's not a schmo desperate for his you know taxi medallion. <laughs> taxi. Medallion. Sorry, it's like trying to sound like I know all the New York talk. Um, so, right. For, this is my storytelling. Like, that's it for me. That's it for you? No, I don't mean, I mean, I can talk all night. I mean, this, this, this example is like the, the holy grail of marketing storytelling. I can go into another story. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to, any, any riff, any storytelling, any. <laughs> mm. 
the only thing that, of course, popped in my mind was I was in New York two weeks ago, and instead of getting an Uber from down to, from Manhattan to JFK, I'm like, hmm, how much would be a town car to go from New York to JFK? It's actually cheaper to get a down, town car than an Uber. Which I thought was interesting. Wow. So they need to brush up on their marketing, the whole town car thing. I mean, they could really make a lot of money. Well, what's interesting is, of course, they clearly were, but I'm wondering if Uber prices that because they don't want those, oh. right? Because that's the other thing, is you have to set pricing based on how, you know, yeah. whether you, I mean, one of the reasons that Brown Jordan sells $1,500 chairs is they don't want to make hundreds of thousands of chairs. If they did, they'd be selling them in, you know, office, not off. what am I thinking of, Home Depot. And they don't want to sell them there. They want you to buy them carefully and slowly. Yeah, so. That's true. Um, so, oh, okay. I'm going to tell another story. Go ahead. And this story actually originally came to my mind because one of my clients is OM, and they're a furniture manufacturer. They do office um, chairs. And if you're in one of the senior studios, you might be sitting in their chairs. They've done a couple of design charrettes with your predecessors over the years. Um, okay, I don't know why I told you that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, oh, I know why. Because I sit in this room and listen to the presentations from the students on the design, um, the, the final design and the pieces that are going to go in your portfolio. And one of the interesting observations I made is how much we presume that other people want to buy into the story that we're telling them. And they don't. We have to make them want to buy the story that we're telling them. And that works in your, um, as you're going into an interview, it works when you're presenting a project to Max, it works um, at any job that you're going to have, it works when you're trying to convince someone to go on a date with you, um, it works when you're trying to get your parents to do something that you want them to. You have to like make an argument, tell a story. And watching other people present m made me remember something that happened in my professional career. So I'm working at Brown Jordan, and we had a design office in Long Beach on Pine Avenue. And my boss was the chief design officer, which meant that he got paid an absolutely obscene amount of money to be the only guy at Brown Jordan who designed their chairs. That was his job and no one else in the company designed chairs. And he came in one day and he did a presentation to them about a product that he called Space. And let's give him some props because it was 2002 and this was sort of the representation. And I want you to just sort of look at the mark in the middle of the page and just kind of remind yourself that that's not there by accident, okay? And then he decided he's gonna tell them, like, what is space? It's an outdoor living room, it's furnishings, it's you know, weatherproof, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes in and they reject his idea. And, and obviously he had a sketch, and unfortunately I don't have the sketch because I didn't know I was gonna be talking about it 16 years, years later. later. <laughs> um, but they rejected his idea. And all of us in the design studio kept thinking, are they, have they lost their minds? And I remember thinking, um, you're their designer. Like, it's your job to give them product? Like, why are they going to say no to you? Like, you're the guy they're paying to design for them. They don't want it. So he actually has a contract where if they reject it, he can take it to a third party. So he goes out and he takes it to someone else. And if you look at the piece, you'll think, oh, that's actually... C. It's Janice AC. Well, it's, it's D-Don, but D Janice Same imported thing. it. Okay. Yeah. But, okay, so first of all, the shape of that object on his presentation is this. I love those, by this. the way. They're so awesome to sit in. Okay, yeah. They're freaking awesome. Yeah. And um, this is a shot at the Monte Carlo Hotel, which is representative of the fact that I could have, without any work at all, pulled 50 luxury hotels where this item is on their pool oh, deck. Yeah. Okay, I mean, there are probably 500. Yeah. But 
this is an unfreaking believable piece of furniture. And if you can imagine in 2002 that absolutely nobody was making outdoor furniture that didn't just look like a chair. Like this was, this was radical. And um, Interior Design Magazine was all over it and they had all these contests. And then by the way, I'm showing this. <laughs> Because they also decided, like they did a million different ad campaigns, but I'm showing this partly because on the far left, that's actually Richard Frenier who designed it and he's oh, a really? graduate here. And so I just wanted to give him props. And then secondly, this is like really fun, not only because it's funny to have a chair in a, you know, on a baseball, baseball field, field, but also that um, it's about home. It's about finding your home. Like this was the idea of this chair, it was about finding your space and finding home in your own outdoors. And so it's like this really lovely sort of casual um, implied concept that you're safe at home. I don't know if that's a gesture for being out, but whatever. I mean, in any case, the reason that this whole story for me is interesting is again this idea that your responsibility to yourself is that when you have a great idea like you need to imagine it not only from everything that you want it to be like um, you know what does the product look like what are the colors look like what's it made out how does of it function how does it function what am i going to name it how am i going to show those boards how's it going to hold up that's a huge question for right clients. yeah and and you have and and you have to think about your client right what are what are the things that are important to my client like the person who wants a canning kitchen but but that aside how am I going to talk about this in a way where the person who's hearing the message is going to be sold? Because fundamentally, the thing that blows my mind is that this guy was paid. Like, if you think that you're going to get hired by somebody and then go in and design something cool for them and that they're just going to go, oh, my God, that's awesome. Done. Done. <laughs> it's not. Even though they're paying you to design for them, it's not. So you're... Like, and then it's where the joy comes from. You're talking from. about the creative person is not necessarily the best marketing salesperson, but the sales part and the marketing part is key to helping you get ahead. I mean, it really is. You have to be able to be able to articulate what you're thinking and feeling about your product, how it's going to enhance their life, how it's going to make their home better. You know, it really is about all of that. But it's also really understanding your client and what their needs are. So we were talking in the car earlier about the fact that, oh, at some point in our lives, we realized that we're therapists. But <laughs> totally. The, it's like 80% of my, nah, maybe 70% of my job description. But, <laughs> but it's not simply the, oh, hey, how are you feeling today? No. It's the understanding what makes somebody tick. Is it the money they're going to have to spend to invest in the tooling for what you designed? Is it the price point that it's going to have to get sold at? Is it... Um, it's knowing where they are in their lives. Are they an empty nester? Are they about to have a baby? Are they single? Are they looking to get married and they're dating someone significantly? You know, because that's going to change their life and their structure. And then what you do for them, give and takes from that. And this is really funny, by the way, because everything that I'm saying, I'm putting through this lens of that you're sitting in a boardroom and that your sales vice president and your marketing vice president and your operations <laughs> vice president are sitting there and everything Jen is saying is that you're sitting in front of your client in their <coughs> living room and that they're responding to you. But in either case, the, the fundamentals work. It's, you know, and it's the fact that, so Richard, you know, sat in a room with the operations guy, with the finance guy, with the sales guy, et cetera. And, you know, and it could be with the mom, with the dad, with the oldest child, with whomever. And you have to know what are the things that are going to tick for this person? What are the obstacles that I need to overcome? What research do I need? You know, and some of you are going to find that you're brilliant designers but that you don't articulate the story well. So you're gonna want a strong marketing partner. You know, who's gonna name this for me? Or you might not be great with color, but you may be great with function. I mean, they're all, and so most of us, oh, and then this ties in the other part, which is that you're gonna, I mean, we think that you're gonna end up finding out that collaboration 
is really where you're going to soar. I because mean, you, you can tell who's marketing, right? And who's designer right here. <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> because she's like, oh, da, 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 da. and I'm like, oh, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, but, but there's, you said earlier that like you, ha like every one of you has a voice and every one oh, of yeah. you is unique, right? And so, and for me, I kept, I spent a lot of my younger career uh, jumping around to, s I worked in construction, oh, investment too. banking, fundraising for a university, um, working in a magazine, working, I mean, and, and that's so valid. All of those little parts and pieces, because one of the things I really wanted to share with you guys tonight was how much as a student I put, I made it hard on myself because I had to do it the right way. Oh, I, my path, I want to be a commercial designer, so I'm going to work for an architectural firm, and I just wanted all these things to line up just so, right? Because you have this idea. Let it go. Just be open to all these different opportunities that are going to come to you because you just don't know how they all add up. When I look back at how it all added up so far, I'm like, oh my God, I would have never guessed. I wanted some of the things that I have now, not the whole thing. I wouldn't have known it yet. But I mean, I remember being in college, I was maybe a maybe in a year into interior design school and I got this opportunity to work for this drapery workroom on Saturdays mornings or something I was like whatever I was just not into this idea but I decided okay I'm gonna do it you know I need a part-time job I'm gonna do it well from that just because I took this little job I didn't even think of from that I only okay back up I was just working Saturday mornings okay so I was only there like three or four hours after I'd been there for a couple months, the owners of that company saw my design sense and started lining up clients for me on Saturday mornings. <laughs> and they made their like uh, big, they had this big warehouse space and they put me in an office in there and I would just meet with these people and I would just help them with their drapery and their designs for their house. And I hated their hardware, so I designed my whole, <laughs> I designed a whole line of drapery hardware for them. <laughs> And then I started painting on myself, making myself, and then that company ended up buying my hardware. <laughs> so it was just, oh, this little tiny part-time job, you know? And there's just lots of little stories like that that I have that have lined up for me. And it's just because I followed my passion and wanted I really wanted to do, so. That's pretty cool. Yes. Um, I don't know why that reminded me, because this is not necessarily connected, but that one of the other things that we were talking about was the idea that, um, like I love LinkedIn, and I love LinkedIn because it manifests a reality that exists without it, which is that we are all connected. Like you're gonna be amazed at the people that you meet who know someone else who know someone else. True. And the only thing that something like LinkedIn does is it shows it to you, so you don't have to go dig it up. But the, um, the idea of, like seeing sort of like your young career as almost a treasure hunt or a, or a, I was saying earlier like a video game. It's like you have a knapsack on, run around and pick up as much stuff as you can because you never know when you're gonna need it again and you're gonna be amazed. Like, oh, that's where the little drapery hardware thing comes in. Well, yeah, Sorry, it just showed my whole entrepreneur spirit. Like I was like, oh, I have all that in me? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You know, just these other mundane things that you don't even think are gonna be a big deal end up being a huge big deal. It's right. fun. So, okay, I think, I think, I think, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, kitchen aid. So, <laughs> one last, like, sort of storytelling thing, which, again, is about knowing your audience, is, um, so, KitchenAid makes, frankly, the most, like, bomb-ass blenders in the world. If you don't have one, you need to put it on your Christmas or your holiday <laughs> list right now. But, so this is from the 50s, and there's Bud and there's Dad, and this could not be any more 1950s <laughs> white 50s. America. But that aside, um, what I love is that now, and it's not the greatest scan in the world, now it's a fine-tuned engineering device for slicing and dicing, and it is calibrated to your countertop. I don't even know what that means, <laughs> okay? But it, this is high-end and en like engineering and whatnot. And when you're staring at that and you're thinking, where have I seen that before? And then you think, oh, and this is another little shot that's from their video, okay? And then you're like, oh, this is where I've seen that before. And granted, this is a stretch metaphorically, but I'm an art history major. 
It's everything that's about like, you know, sex and power and desire is it's red and it's looking right at you. And red you know, and yeah. And if that scan were better, by the way, that background would be black and not gray, but you know. So um, again, it's just like knowing your audience, telling your story, um, visualization. And I think there was something else I was going to throw in there, but <laughs> it'll come up. It'll, it'll come, come back. up. It'll come up. I hope. Um, you guys want to ask us stuff? Yeah. Hello. Hello. I have, I have a question about just the marketing process. When you um, are marketing an idea or product, how do, how do you take into account um, those consumers who may have a knee-jerk reaction to see marketing as at least partially, maybe inherently dishonest? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, this whole idea of authenticity, which a few years ago seemed like kind of a fresh um, approach, now seems a little cliched, right? Like everyone's talking about authenticity. Um, I personally like have a have a really complicated um, relationship with my profession now because I'm at a point now where I drive a 20 year old car and I buy my clothes at a thrift store deliberately because I'm sick of, of us making there's enough that's what I say in here um, I think for me I specifically only pick clients who are actually making things that I feel like they have some sort of real connection to and it's it's cliched, but it's true. Oh, and also that ties into something else that I, I wanted to talk on, which is five. So I'm going to say that. The specific answer, I think, to your question is that every brand and every company does have a truth to it, whether you agree with the truth or not. And if you find that truth, like what are they really? What are they really making and how are they really making it? And then you market to that that's how you address it because the alternative is that you you lie and you dissemble and then that's when like social media rips you apart and nobody wants to be in that mess and that's why you know Kendall Jenner and Pepsi or whatever that debacle was and Dolce and Gabbana and their you know racist ads and all that like all that stuff comes out of not knowing who you are and then just like doing things for no reason the five thing is because, so most of my young career, I worked for huge companies, you know, um, $100 million in revenues or more, or considered the largest firm in the, you know, in the world and what they did, that kind of stuff. And when I went out on my own, which again was 15 years ago, I was thinking, oh man, you know, I printed up. 1500 of my brochures and I was researching names everywhere and I was sending this media stuff out everywhere and writing press releases and everything and at some point in my career I looked at myself and thought you know what Leslie you can pay your rent and buy groceries if five people in the world trust you to help them with their company so I have five clients and two or three of them mostly pay the bills and the other two are for fun or just you know come and go but when i started realizing that your life is i mean my life and i don't know anyone else that this is different for can be meaningful and robust and financially viable with a handful then this idea of it being real and true is actually something that you can talk about without sounding like an idiot because you can find at least five other people that you respect for some reason, you know, and, and market for them. Thank you. Sure. Anyone? Uh, I have a question for design. Um, so uh, when you come up with your own brand, um, what's your, um, how do you come up with your own vision or a vision, like your goal? And like, how do you design your like own logo? Like, how, where do you find inspiration? All of my, all of our fabrics and tiles and whatnot are all driven from nature and celestial. So we just always been drawn. My my um, partner and I both are obsessed with that. Just 
drawn to it ourselves. So it's really easy for us to come up with those kind of ideas and patterns. And we love our logo because it's just this playful, and it just should, says everything about us as a brand. Um, and we love to use it even by its, and one of the things, because I'm a graphics designer too, is that you can use your logo by itself and it stands for your brand without even the words. And I, so I really wanted that too, because I can see eventually how we'll just do, the, I call them the doodads, but eventually we'll just use my doodads and not the words. But, you know, for me, it was, I'm a graphic designer, so part of me, <laughs> what's really hard for me is I draw all my own logos and I get all excited about them. But for this, I actually let it go. I, I came up with a couple of the little guys and images that we love, and we found some other things on Pinterest. Like, we made a whole Pinterest board just for inspiration for our logo. And um, I do use it. And, um, and, but then I gave that to a graphic designer because I wanted to be separate from it. I wanted it to just evolve and become its own so that I could participate with it that way instead of it always be all in here. And that was really fun for me. That was a kind of a luxury for me because usually I come up with my own. Yeah. Oh, if I can add on that actually is that one, I think it's really important for all of us to you know, like play widely because it's inspiring, but then to kind of recognize what your lane is because, for instance, great interior designers or great textile designers may not be good logo designers. And I think my graphics helps me with my patterns. Um, I want There's something I was going to tell you, though, about that. Um, <laughs> because I, wa I just wanted to say that one of the things that absolutely cracks me up is that um, this, if I ever freaking get there, oh, where it says design resource at the bottom, that's actually the logo for that company. It was designed by Richard Frenier. Okay, oh. so I'm, I mean, I'm making fun of him because he's not here, but here's the thing. This is a guy who's clearly freaking genius enough to design that, but he also insisted on designing design resource, like set like that. Like, that's not a logo, but he thinks it is. And so that's a nice reminder of not staying in your lane. <laughs> Sorry. I think, though, to add to what we were saying is that, for me, the logo had to really depict all, like, I wanted to be perceived all of my designs. Even though these designs I don't even know yet, that I haven't even designed, I wanted to always have this representation of what we are about. And I felt like that did it. It was playful, it was fun, it was sophisticated enough, but it was also laid back. And how did you get, like where did Maple Jude come from? Um, Maple Jude is a, um, it's a made up place. It's in our imagination. We've made it up, it's this farm that we just want to live in. <laughs> it's this land in Northern California that my partner, uh, my business partner, I both want this land where we can have goats and, mm -hmm. and um, so both of our families can live there. So we just, it started as this muse, honestly. And, and it wasn't even gonna be the name of the company, but it was, we were always talking about, oh yeah, when we go to the farm, when we go to the farm. So it just became our muse. And then we're like, one day we're like, why, we love, that's our farm, you know? So hopefully you guys, one day you can come visit my farm. It's gonna be called Maple Jude. People can come. <coughs> One of the things I thought of when you were telling the story about the farm in Northern California is yeah. I was reminded of um, anthropology, which if you've ever walked into anthropology, and it's obviously targeted towards women. So it's triggering a lot of, you know, like nesting instincts and like the, the desire for tactile, you know, experience and, and treatiness Travel. Travel and whatnot. Yeah. But the reason that it works is because from a marketing perspective, they did not sit down and say, we want to be a homeware store. They did not sit down and say, we want to be a clothing designer. <coughs> what they sat down and said is, we want to sell to Betty. She's 40, she makes $100,000 a year. She lives in an urban environment and she's interested in cooking and this and that. And we also want to sell to, and they basically defined three women, and they gave them a name, and they, 
explicitly what's their personality, how much money, everything. And then they went out and they put everything in that store that Betty and Veronica and, you know, Scooby-Doo want to buy. <laughs> Sorry. And, and that's why it works. And that's why it's so sticky. And it's also why you're not surprised when you see books in there and you see pottery and et cetera. So when you... Like, I didn't know this about Maple Jude. I had this vision of these, you know, like really fabulously graphic, um, you know, patterns. And what I liked also was the sense of um, cohesion to the collection of it. That I knew that I was in a mind that like had, had created a box and said, this is like, I'm not trying to be all things. I'm trying to be this in these colorways and these items. Boom. But when you tell me about Maple Jude, and I can see it in this image, is now you're, you're signaling that there's this space where if oh, you yeah. start selling maple syrup, I'm not going to be surprised because that can live within this farm story. Yeah. Yeah. You want so, garden stuff. Yeah. Shovels. So it's a, great, it's a great question because it also points out that two of the problems with creating a brand is A, naming a brand after yourself because then you know we, you we toiled with that because yeah. i already have the interior design studio so we're like do we keep my name in it do we do but we much i much prefer this right because you get to play with something else and then um i forgot what the other there's the name oh and then there's the naming it too specifically right because if you name it like you know jen's part you know auto parts she can't ever sell anything else and so you know the same thing would go with your product design studios but help max yeah. how did you come up with the um the uh like patterns and stuff were they just like doodles and then there, it's all there some are really specific like I was like this is going to be a pattern you know, this is going to be, and then some are just doodles. Um, but it, you're, it's a good question because it's such a different animal when you actually take a little doodle and you have to make it into a certain, you know, like 54, 54 inch good wide fabric. Um, yeah, but we lay it out on um, Illustrator. Can you, is it interesting to anyone to talk about like where product is sourced? Um, how you find manufacturing partners is that because um, well, Jen, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share that Jen with can you. tell you a story. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things in LA that's very interesting in the design field is everybody's. You know, I have friends that have their own uh, fabric lines, and no one would tell me how to get a, go get to a mill or to. And I was like, Are you kidding me? Like you couldn't, you couldn't get in touch with people because you had to have these relationships, or you had to know someone who knows somebody. And it's mills that you're hiring to produce your goods, but you still had to have an inward way, right? So I decided, well, they can't be only just one way. I'm going to figure this out myself. So because I kept trying to, you know, work relationships, try to figure it out, ask people directly, they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't share my their sources. So. We now we mill all of our fabrics in the UK because I found a mill in the UK. And eventually, hopefully we'll be local because I'll build those relationships and now they see what we've made and so forth. But um, I just pushed my way through it, figured it out. Well, so for me, when Jen told me that story, A, I wasn't surprised, and then B, just yesterday in the New York Times, which sounds all like snobby and whatnot but if you don't subscribe I highly recommend it because their style section so good is so good and they're and they talk about design and um, the story the other day is about flannel and the fact that you cannot in this country mill the fabric to make a flannel shirt you have to go to China well that's outrageous so the guys who started um, American Giant and those totally cool hoodies like went back and essentially resurrected all of the you know and it's a multi-part process it's not you have to 
yarn dye the you know raw material and then you have to um, actually loom you have to mill the piece and then you have to have someone finish it and then you have to cut it and sew it and so now it's a hundred and eighteen dollars shirt but um, it's the beginning of bringing that kind of manufacturing I just read back. in House Beautiful or one of the magazines yesterday that flannel sheets are coming back mm -hmm. well you know and you know and again what I find fascinating is that it's um, is that the backstory to that is that all of you as designers know that what you're doing is you have to make something or you have to design something but then you have to design something that's actually realistic to get made and then the the power is when for instance like the American giant guy who's now going to launch hundred and eighteen dollar flannel shirts people are going to um, they're going to buy them, A, because he markets them well, but when you look at it and you realize what it took to make that happen, that's where, the, that's where great design is. And that's how people can, that's how you can keep people from knocking you off. You have to find the edge. You have to find the thing that makes it special or makes it difficult. Um, the thing that Brown Jordan did that made their chairs $1,500 was engineering them in a way where you only had to um, weld them like X number of times. Um, or they would use you know, some other kind of sophisticated engineering that other people wouldn't want to deal with the effort to, to figure out the science of. So, you know, again, and that's the same thing Apple does, right? It's like they, they corner the technology and then they corner the aesthetics of it and then it's too expensive. It was for a long time. It was too expensive for people to mimic them. So. One other thing I want to add too is I love the sketches so much in black and white that the first collection, every pattern comes in black and white. <laughs> but it was because I got so attached to the way they were and then when I started adding color to them, it bothered me, so <laughs> I kept them all in black and white, and then I had one colorway for each pattern. So is the company just um, textiles right now? Uh, no, we have ceramic tile too, oh, okay. and every pattern of our uh, textiles come in a ceramic tile, and we have uh, dog beds, uh, what? linens. Yeah, <laughs> Rosie was on one today. Oh yeah, 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 um, I saw that. Uh, oh, there they are. Table, uh, napkins, tea towels. Yeah, we're starting that part of it. Makeup bags. <laughs> um, and actually, when I saw Jen's tiles at West Edge, and they're s ceramic. ceramic. Yep. And it also <coughs> triggered a reminder for me that one of the things that I love about living in Southern California and actually being a native of Southern California is that we live in one of the most design rich parts of the country and New York gets all this attention because they have a lot of media there they have a lot of you know print media but but the history of Los Angeles and Southern California in general if you don't know it is absolutely ripe with people radically changing the way that we live I mean we invented the drive-in yeah. we invented like drive-through you know, burgers. We invented outdoor living. Um, when the aerospace engineering or the aerospace companies came here, they brought all kinds of materials that people hadn't been using. I mean, we invented outdoor furniture, um, glassware and, you know, ceramic and concrete as tile, like all of this stuff. So you're living in a material, materially rich um, environment. And, you know, one of the the interesting things to me about Jen's story of having to go to the UK to mill something that seems so mundane is that there there are actually mills here in Southern California. Oh, there's tons. But but one of the other great joys is you know like getting out on the street and looking at who are the metal workers and the glass workers and the you know like whatever materials you're in and like finding them and resurrecting them and creating you know like products and, and projects right here. The mill we chose actually helped us a lot just starting out because they didn't have, they didn't make us do large quantities. So it happened to be UK, which I feel like I get a lot of good feedback. Oh, it's UK. So that's cool. <laughs> but honestly, it was more about the business dealings and how it was easy for us to work with them in a, as a startup. Um, I actually looked at Vietnam 
because I have a really close friend that had connections in Vietnam. So there was a lot of other places that we looked to actually get those sources, but it ended up being the UK was great for us. One of the things, and I don't have an answer for this, but in my practice, I try to look for, um, like looking at every business deal as if I'm playing pool, so that my job isn't necessarily to shoot straight at the ball that I'm after and you know straight into that pocket, but wh where can I bank? Like if I'm looking this way instead, can I get to where I'm going? And for me, because what's astonishing is Jen's challenge might have been that there wasn't a mill that used the kind of fiber that she needed here, or they might not have had a loom that was wide enough, or they might have only woven but not printed. And I could go down this like litany of stuff where all of a sudden, no matter what we're talking about, you might be talking about cardboard boxes for you know like a makeup or a product, or you might be talking about metal for something you know technical, or you might be talking about molding plastic. I mean, there's any number of things. But it's going to be astonishing to you the sort of um, limitations that you're not going to expect when you get into tooling for something. And you know, looking for a loom is one kind of tooling. And so um, being able to look at the, the other person as a potential business partner, not just can you sell this to me, but how can I talk about this in a way where it might be interesting to you also? And I'll go back to that American giant flannel shirt example, is that he had the same you know, challenge. These guys didn't want to do it because for them to warp up you know, a loom that much, they wanted to sell them 100,000 yards. And he's like, well, I don't even know if anyone's going to buy it. But, but you constantly want to be looking at the person across the table from you as, a, as your teammate, not your adversary. And what can you offer? Like, is it interesting to them? Does it increase their reputation? Is there, you know, will they take delayed payment? You know, can you sell Kickstarter before there's any cash involved? I mean, all kinds of things, but, but the idea of, of collaboration and, and looking at, at all kinds of different ways of, I'm not even sure where that, I'm just gonna let that fall off the cliff. Well, <laughs> one thing I'll touch on what you're talking about is for me, when you're talking about, I cannot look at limits. Because if I look at the limits, I'll never do it. Because there's always some excuse, right? There's always some excuse, oh, I, oh my god, I can't do that. I can't find the fabric mill. I can't find this. I can't find that. My ceramics, I, everybody pushed me back. What are you doing to start your own ceramic tile company? Are you kidding me? You know, like, it's such an old school kind of thing. So I'm like this newbie in it and I'm doing it all these new ways and people are going, oh, well, no one does that, but you can get away from it with it because you're new, you know. But if I would have looked at all those limits and all those people telling me not to do it, I mean, I, I would, my hands would be tied. I'd be in the corner crying. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do anything. So, you know, I, I think that's true. I think we always have to look at the people that we're in front of and see how we can help one another and collaborate for sure. I, and again, in the random association thing. Um, so I went to UCLA, and then I've lived within five miles of, of campus for 30 years now. And I'm amazed at the number of times that I run into people that I've known somewhere at some other point in my professional oh, wow. life. And one of the things that absolutely blows me away is that about two or three years ago, and, and I used to play a lot of soccer, and this guy moved here from London, and he, you know, was like educated and well traveled and thought he was very sophisticated and he like hired me to do a job and we were going to meet up in Westlake Village which is almost an hour you know from from campus and he wanted to do something that I thought was a little bit like inappropriate shady you know whatnot and I said dude I think that you really misunderstand what a small town Los Angeles is Everybody knows everybody in this town. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy because there are 17 million people who live in LA. How can that possibly be a small town? And we show up at this meeting and walk in the door and the very first person who stands up and says, oh my God, and sticks his hand out is a guy that we play soccer with <laughs> from you know, an hour back home, right? And I looked at my friend and I thought, Yes, like I'm not crazy. But the positive side of that story is that like 
that's the joy of like where you are. Like you're at the beginning of, oh my gosh, I'm gonna start collecting all of these people, other people in this classroom, other people at jobs. You might have five jobs in your 20s. I had 10. I had a job every year because they didn't stick. But I, I know too. people from there yeah, and I, I learn too. things and then I run into them somewhere else. And when you're, when you're true to yourself, when you're true to your message, whether it's because you're representing another client or representing yourself, you know, those people are gonna be like, oh, hey, you know, it's less. I wanna work with you, or I wanna help you, or I have information for you, so. I had, a, I had a real personal challenge in my life, which was that I got to a certain point in my profession where I was really successful. I had a great title, I made like stupid money, and I bought a house. And I thought, oh, like that's what you're supposed to want. And then like that is the signifier that you're okay. And it turned out I was miserable. And this is such a like, how many times have we heard this freaking story? But I was absolutely miserable. And I worked all the time. And um, that's when I quit to start my company. And I quit a month after I signed a mortgage on my house. So talk about surprising everybody. And then I thought, well, I need to be wildly successful at my own business because I need to prove to people that I'm competent. And the only reason or the only way that you can prove that you're good at something is if you make a lot of money. And it turns out that that is a bunch of that we have been like taught from, you know, our, the cradle. And Here's the thing, you know what absolutely excites me is that at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm in the swimming pool across the street from my house, like swimming, because I don't care anymore. But what I do care about are the five people who do pay me. And if they call me at seven o'clock at night, I'll pick up the phone because I know that they paid for me to be in the pool at 11, which makes me happy. Because if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, which frankly, the older and older you get, that's not so impossible. It's like, <laughs> this happens to us and it's not funny, it's fucking tragic. And then you're like, why am I running around after money? So for me, it also meant that I don't have a large firm. I don't have a huge office, I don't have 20 people, I don't have a conference room with really sexy furniture. But, but what I do have is a life that makes me happy mm -hmm. and, it's, um, and it's something where I'm constantly like checking back in and making sure that A, like my fear is I need to be relevant. And let's be honest, I'm living in a world that's changing so rapidly at a point in my life when I want to change a lot less rapidly like I'm kind of like ready to just slide on my laurels and I can't um, yeah I think with me I echo you I want to live to work not work to live so for me I really wanted to stay small I'm also a huge perfectionist <laughs> and love to do everything myself so within that span of my I can do a lot um, I want to only grow that much I have incredible people that work for me but I still wanted to have ties to everything because my name's on the door. So, and then like you, I love that I have the freedom to do things in the middle of the day and I can control my own schedule and I'm totally available for clients as you in the, whatever time they call me because of that freedom. And, but keeping it to a smaller number really lets me have that lifestyle. And that's most important to me. Yeah, and you More know, than big. and at the risk of turning it, you know, like a little too political, but I think that we're living in a time when we're questioning a lot of the economic and like social expectations that a lot of us were raised with, and having the freedom to say, you know what, like I want to have humility, I want to learn my craft, I want to pay my dues. I want to, you know, work for someone else and understand, you know, how do I talk to a client? How do I negotiate? How do I survive making a mistake and like get up and own it and apologize to the client and make it right? Like those are things that you you have to pay your dues. You got to know what it feels like to let somebody down and to know how to stand up and make it right. Um, you yeah. know, how how do you lose a client and then think, oh man, if I don't get some something soon. That's my rent next month. Um, 
but that but that the fantasy that the only way to be happy or the only way to succeed would be to have you know like a, a massive studio with sixty employees. Like I just you know well, that somebody, was a, that that's was somebody's happiness. Yeah, it's not ours. It's just not ours. And and being able to own how you define you know what you want your practice to look like. Um, and then on my product side, having it not my namesake, having it this having maple Jew. You know, I'm happy to be a creative director. I'm happy to start, you know, I can step back and I can let it be its own thing. Um, that's one of the reasons why I love it, too, because it's, it, it's having its own life, you know. For my design studio, it's so much more personal in a way. Um, it's like, they're both my babies, but for some reason I have this letting go more for my products. Most of the, most of the stuff that I do is somewhat innocuous, right? I mean, I'm, I'm promoting furniture, I'm promoting tile, I'm promoting textiles. Um, you know, sometimes I've worked with uh, satellite-based Wi-Fi on airplanes. I mean, these are <laughs> things that don't like inherently um, trigger people. Um, but things that I used to do, like think about, like for instance, think about the fact that all outdoor furniture was always had a good looking woman sitting in it. And I would think to myself, yeah, but 80% of the people who buy furniture are women and gay men. So why, like, why are there no good looking men sitting in chairs? And you would have thought that I had lost my mind, um, but that's not outrage culture. But, but the idea of starting to think about who else can we put in the photo? Can we put a man in the photo? Can we put a person of color in the photo? I mean, like, why is this so crazy in LA, for God's sakes, you know, like show who's here? Um, I mean, the nice thing for me about being a somewhat small business is that you can't make um, huge mistakes like that. Like you can't do, you know, Kendall Jenner size mistakes when you're you don't have that kind of a budget, right? Um, you know, and and frankly, for the most part, between a if you're a, a thoughtful human being in general, you're just not going to do stupid things like that. The the Dolce yeah. and Gabbana thing with the the videos. I mean, that's not an honest mistake. Like that comes from something that's uneducated or willfully stupid. Uh, in in my opinion. Yeah, and the other thing, I one of the articles that I read about the Dolce and Gabbana thing was where somebody said, "Didn't anybody say anything?" And I remember thinking, "Oh, right, because that's what happens in large businesses." is the junior person's not going to say something. The assistant to the photographer, like, like everyone's job is dependent on, on like going, oh my god, I can't believe they're doing this, and looking away, which is the joy of being in a small business because, A, the you're... The buck stops here. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and also, I'm not afraid of getting fired because it is my business so I can't fire me like I have to for me one really popped up clear it was the first the second time I ever had a fire a client I couldn't make her happy no matter what I did even when I did specifically what she asked I couldn't make her happy and it's not about you know making friends and making but you want your client to be pleased you want to move on to the next thing and it was, I'm trying to think of even where to begin because it was pretty intense. Um, we did a living room and um, one of the things I do when I do custom furniture is I have a client go to the workroom and sit in the furniture. So they know they love it before we actually fully upholster it. So she wanted, it was a smaller living room. We made these custom chairs on swivels and I took her to the, the uh, upholster and they're not fully upholstered, they're just like in muslin. So you. You know, if we can change it up, we can put more uh, feathers or down or however we do it and make it more comfortable or if she wants a deeper cushion, we can, uh, we can change it at that point. She came and she loved them. She was so nervous about them but she, up until that point, but she loved them. So I was like, oh my God, because it was all about these chairs for this woman. Um, we get to install her living room. I installed her whole living room. We put the chairs in and she hates them. No, mind you, nothing changed from the moment that she left the showroom and sat in them. I just put <coughs> fabric over them. I mean, truly, they didn't change at all.
but there was always, and there was just always something like that big, pivotal, um, and she had just a lot of issues, and we couldn't help her. I mean, I'll share with you, she showed up at my studio one day in tears, crying to my assistant about, talk about being a therapist, about her life, about, you know, all these things, and I'm like, whoa, you know? And it was exhausting for both my sister and I. I mean, it was just not a healthy situation. So I just I said, you know what? We can't help you anymore. That's like, um, it, frankly, it's the same thing as your question about marketing in an inauthentic way. It's like it, you have to know when something's not working. It's like a bad relationship. Yeah, like any, it's you've just got to walk away. And, no thanks. And I was laughing earlier actually because I didn't follow my own gut. And was in a horrible, you know, professional relationship, and it got to the point where the person fired me. And I'm thinking to myself, well, duh, because I should have quit months ago. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, you have to know when something's not working, and it's either, you know, you're misconnecting on a vision, or you're misconnecting on on communication, or the other person's never going to be pleased no matter what you do. Yeah. But, but, I think. For people who are perfectionists or people who work for themselves and know that everything, you know, everything counts to feeding yourself and et cetera, um, it's actually incredibly liberating to, to get fired or to fire somebody and to realize that you can survive it. Yeah, because you don't want to do it. I mean, it feels horrible. And, and I'm one of those people that I give my heart and soul. I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'm going to do this for you. I'm so excited about it. And so when that happened, it was like, oh my God. It was hard, it was really hard, but it was much better for us. And I ha as a owner of the company, you have to think of the whole, you can't just, you know. If it was me, maybe I would have pushed through, but. So again, I'm working for Brown Jordan, and it was in the like late 90s, I think, and I needed to build a website. And it was back in the day when you actually had to have everything custom programmed. So not just the entire interface, but you also had to have the e-commerce section custom programmed. And it also meant um, tying in like third-party sales tax software and all this stuff. So this is a big deal. So I'm in a, in a project with the designer and the programmer, and the target date is a trade show that happens in June. And I need to launch this brand new site with all of our product uploaded and um, you had to be able to define which finishes you wanted, which fabrics you wanted, and you know, and et cetera. So I keep looking at all of these designs come through, and I'm signing off on stuff, whatnot, whatnot, and I keep saying, "Hey, so when am I actually going to see like you know like something on the on the internet?" And I keep hearing, "Okay, well let's you know let's look at the design of this, and let's look at the design of that," and it's going on and on and on. And now it's getting to be like two weeks before the trade show, and I'm still saying, so when am I going to like see something on the internet? And you have to forgive me, by the way, that honest to God, this was like in the early days. So I'm just thinking that doo 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 is like, you know, the guy at, you know, the Wizard of Oz or whatever is behind the curtain building something. So imagine my surprise when then about a week before, and I'm like, okay, so am I gonna see it? The programmer emails me and says, all right, so you've signed off on all of the pages for the design, I'll go ahead and get started, and you'll see something in three months. <laughs> oh my God. And I'm thinking to myself, like, so now I have to sell my house and move to Mexico, because obviously <laughs> I've, utterly failed and I can't show up at work tomorrow like I'm you know and this was a Friday late late afternoon so like any sane person I drive immediately to my older brother's office and lay down on the floor in his office and like I'm totally effed I'm completely effed how do I run away <coughs> and my brother says to me ah this is why you get paid the big bucks and I started laughing because he and I also have this little family joke. That one of the fundamental differences between being 18 and bright and creative and charming and you know articulate and being 50 or whatever is experience. There's nothing else different. It's just experience. And so you know what you do when people pay you a lot of money to be an executive at a company and you're watching your entire future explode? 
you get up and you get on the phone and you start finding somebody else who can build that website for you in a week. And I did. And I had a contract with a guy on Monday. He had the whole thing up for me by Friday. I was proofreading it over the weekend. I walked into a board meeting on Sunday and presented the website in which I was strategically navigating to the parts of it that I knew worked while, you know, after the meeting, I was still back in the hotel room fixing the rest of it. And by Monday morning when the trade show started, that thing was live and there were some little tweaky things that I had to fix over the week. But I love this story because number one, it was clearly my fault because I was asking a question, but I wasn't understanding the answer that I was being given. I should have known from that, I should have known that I should have been seeing something. And, and I'm constantly amazed at the fact that it's always in your life, it's the thing that you don't see that's what screws you up. Because you can always look at something and go, oh look, there's a mistake, let me fix it. It's the thing that you don't see, it's like the black hole out there. That's what gets you. So like, I'm always thinking, right, look for the thing that I haven't seen yet. And then the second thing is you can't give up because there's always a solution. It's like finding a oh, mill yeah. or finding another, like somebody out there wants to be like, hell yeah, what a great thing. It, sh it should take me three months, but let me do it in a week. Like, you know, so. And successes, um, I think for me, the most exciting thing is when clients trust you. When they're like, Girl, you got it, you just do it. On three occasions, I've been given keys to a house, they leave town, and they say, do it. And it was amazing. I get shivers just sitting here thinking about it. And one of them was for a 16-year-old girl, her bedroom, her mom wanted me to do it. And I had like a month and a, I think I had about six weeks. And she had a turret, do you guys know what a turret is? It's like a round room off of a castle, but part of it, the house was that. And we built these uh, low beds with all these pillows. And I did this custom bed with this little drawer where you could hire to hide a diary in. It was really cool. And the girl's face when she walked in, oh my god, it was so much fun to see that and bring that much joy to somebody. That was so <laughs> but those kind of situations, because that's such trust, you know, to say, hey, you know, I go in over a few images with them and then they just said, go for it. That was fun. For me, I know CAD, or I'm really just dangerous in it, <laughs> and I have some that works for me that's completely amazing at it, but for me, I'm very much hands-on sketching, because it's kind of like what I was showing you with my presentation board. I like showing, sharing the process with the clients, especially residential, because residential is so personal for them that it's kind of, I find it's more successful if they kind of go with me on it go on that journey of kind of discovering what it's going to look like. So once I get a sketch to a certain place and they've approved it, then once we want to build it, then we'll put it into CAD. Oh, you know, when you made that comment about journeying, I remember thinking that, oh, right, to go back to that, you know, story of Richard trying to pitch space in, you know, at Brown Jordan, you're a designer, which means that you've spent all of this time learning visual vocabulary. The people that you're pitching to are your sales team, your operations team, your, you know, the finance guy. So most people don't think visually. And it's so easy to forget that because you're surrounded educationally by other visual people that you need to paint them a picture or bring them, you know, samples, things that they can touch because they need that in order to make manifest what you're trying. That's so true. In fact, I'm finding it even more and more so where people, no matter what you show them, like what you used to show, what I used to show like 10 years ago, isn't as good. Like people want more. They want a 3D experience, you know, because they see these 3D renderings, you know, and they want that. Now I'm not, I mean, I can have someone do it. I don't, I'm not versed in that. So it's actually a harder job for me to convince that person. So I, I think my method of like having the three-dimensional thing really does help because it's a, a feeling that they walk away with and they remember that more than just seeing something, you know, makes sense. 3D, you mean like, like items or what? 
Yeah, you know, uh, maybe, oh, here. See how it's all like three dimensional? Like I have dishes and mirrors and ceramics and I have it like stacked on top of each other. I feel like it conveys a feeling more so than even a, that's why people like 3D, because it's a feeling. They feel like they can walk through it. That's what people identify. If they identify with a feeling, they'll remember it because it's an experience. If they just see something, they're probably going to forget about it. I mean, look at all the images you see, right? So I try to tap into that feeling part with the client so they can walk away with something tangible. Yeah, and I can do, I'm pretty good at perspective. So, you know, if it keeps pushing towards that, I can either hire someone that would do a 3D or I do a quick 3D sketch. And I think that's pretty, that's really key now. People really need that to, to answer your question, just to be able to convey the design and sell the design so people know exactly what they're gonna get. When I was younger in my career, I was constantly taking night classes, trying to pick up more skills. Um, you know, can I, can I sketch something or can I use some of the basic software, et cetera. And at some point I finally realized that I can't know everything. You can't be a jack of all trades. Yeah, and the, and the thing is there are natural progressions to your career and you're like, for me, my younger career was I need to learn as much as I can. And then as I got older and older, it's I can specialize and it's okay that I've never opened any part of the Adobe suite in a decade. Because for me to get good at that would take so much time, but that's not what my clients are hiring me for. And it would be like, you know, like Jen designing the logo for Maple Jude. Like at some point she has to I say, to you go. know what? Yeah, like I'm yes. really good at, you know, a vision of a space and sourcing things and getting it done on time and managing the client. That's already four skill sets that you could spend a whole lifetime. She doesn't need to be an expert at, you know, at 3D CAD. rendering or CAD or getting into VR and, you know, doing an entire. And it really is profitable for your business too, because if you do do, I don't know if you guys want to know about the business side, but like literally numbers, um, but you can have subs within your umbrella. Like I have a CAD sub, 3D sub, or whatever different consultants, right? And then you pay them, but then you mark that up back to the client. So let's say you have a CAD person, you pay him 30, 40 bucks an hour, you can charge the client 50, 60 bucks. So it's, I'm just using it as an out, you know. But that's how you build as a, as a small business, that's kind of how you run, you know, because you can't have all those different people. So you, you end up getting a network of good people that you can count on. I mean, I have all the same CAD guy I had 10 years ago, you know. So.